Okay. Good afternoon. Um, we have just uh, concluded the meeting of NATO foreign ministers, the first ever with uh, Sweden as a full uh, member of the uh, alliance. Together we addressed um, preparations for the Washington summit in July, starting with Ukraine. This is a critical moment. The people of Ukraine continue to defend their country with skill and bravery. The Ukrainians have shown time and time again that they are capable. Ukraine has recaptured half of the territory that Russia initially seized. In the Black Sea, Ukraine has pushed back the Russian fleet, enabling the continued export of grain to world markets. The Ukrainians are not running out of courage. They are running out of ammunition. We need to step up now to ensure our support is built to last. So in our meeting today, we discussed how to put our support on a firmer and more enduring basis for the future. All allies agree on the need to support Ukraine in this critical moment. There is a unity of purpose. Today, allies have agreed to move forward with planning for a great NATO role in coordinating security assistance and training. The details will take shape in the weeks to come. But make no mistake, Ukraine can rely on NATO support now and for a long haul. Tomorrow, we'll meet with Minister Koleba in the NATO Ukraine Council. Together, we will discuss Ukraine's current and longer-term needs. Today, ministers also address security challenges in our southern neighborhood, including the enduring threat of terrorism. Last October, I appointed an independent group of experts to review NATO's approach to our southern neighbors. Ministers have discussed the group's find findings and heads of state and government will consider concrete proposals at the summit in Washington. Tomorrow, I'll chair a meeting of foreign ministers with our Indo-Pacific partners, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia, and New Zealand, together with the European Union. We will discuss how to enhance our practical cooperation as well as the global implications of the war against Ukraine. Russia is receiving support for its war of aggression from China, North Korea, and Iran. As authoritarian powers increase in line, it is important that like-minded nations around the world stand together to defend a global order ruled by law, not by force. Tomorrow marks NATO's 75th anniversary. As we face a more dangerous world, the bond between Europe and North America has never been more important. As we prepare for an historic summit in Washington, NATO will continue to support Ukraine, will continue to strengthen our alliance, and will continue to work with our partners across the globe for peace and security. With that, I'm ready to take your questions. Uh, we'll start with Radio Free Europe, please. Radio for Europe. Thank you for giving me the floor, Ukrainian Service and Current Time TV. I have a question regarding this proposal of long-term support for Ukraine, um, especially this uh, $100 billion for five years. Uh, have you discussed it already with the partners and what was their reaction? And do you think that this amount of $100 billion is um, the one you are going to reach? Thank you. Also again, I cannot go into the details of the proposals. Uh, I have seen that you have been extensively briefed, uh, but not by me, uh, and I will not uh, uh, share the details because we are now in the process of uh, developing um, a more robust uh, and enduring um, institutionalized framework for support to Ukraine. What I can say is that, of course, yes, we have discussed it with Ukraine. I, I have discussed it uh, with President Zelensky. I have discussed it recently with uh, Minister Koleba. Uh, and, uh, and uh, we will also discuss it uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, the different ways of ensuring uh, 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 yeah, that our support is less dependent on voluntary uh, uh, short-term uh, offers and more on uh, long-term uh, NATO uh, commitments and that we have a stronger uh, 
organization uh, um, that creates a, a more uh, robust framework for our uh, support. Uh, and this in includes uh, the, um, security assistance, but also uh, training and, uh, and also uh, financing. Um, uh, so, yes, we are in dialogue with, uh, with Ukraine on this because this is actually something that we should do to get together. It matters for Ukraine's security, it matters for our security. Um, uh, uh, economic support uh, to Ukraine is not uh, 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 charity, it's, it's an investment in our own uh, security. Um, and, um, and then uh, to, uh, today we didn't take any final decisions exactly on what format we will establish. Uh, but we agreed to initiate planning, and that's the way we do things in NATO. We, we ask our military authorities to provide the plans, uh, 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 the details, and then we uh, will take the final decisions made uh, uh, based on those uh, uh, proposals and plans that the military authorities will now start to develop for, uh, for us. Thank you. Over to the BBC, Jonathan Beale. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Um, I know your focus has been on Ukraine, but I, I do want to ask you about the Middle East. Um, I know David Cameron, Lord Cameron, wanted to raise what's happened in Gaza. I mean, can you give us your reaction to the, to the, the killing of a number of aid workers in what appears to be an Israeli airstrike, the humanitarian crisis that exists there? And are you worried that a NATO member seems willing and able to provide ammunition and weapons to Israel, but seems unable to do the same for Ukraine. Do you think America has its priorities right? Thank you. So what we see now in Gaza is a humanitarian catastrophe. We see uh, suffering, we see uh, 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 that civilians are uh, killed, uh, and we also uh, saw the uh, uh, strike against uh, aid workers, and uh, I condemn uh, the strike. Uh, I also welcome the fact that uh, Israel has uh, made clear that they will uh, uh, investigate what happened. Um, it demonstrates uh, that uh, uh, the war, which is now going on, uh, has uh, very serious consequences for uh, innocent uh, people. Um, the people living in Gaza, but also uh, aid workers, and therefore I welcome the efforts by uh, the United Kingdom, and by uh, the United States, and by uh, many other allies uh, uh, to facilitate uh, um, some kind of uh, ceasefire and a political solution to uh, this uh, uh, conflict. NATO as an alliance does not play a direct role, but I welcome the efforts of uh, NATO uh, uh, allies. Um, Every day of delay in, uh, in a decision in the United States uh, on providing more support to Ukraine has consequences on the battlefield. That's one of the reasons why the Ukrainians now have to ration uh, ammunition uh, and why uh, they are uh, struggling to uh, keep up uh, with uh, the uh, Russians who are now able to outgun them. Uh, uh, with uh, more weapons and more ammunition than the Ukrainians have. Uh, so we have a responsibility as NATO allies to, to take the decisions and to ensure that the Ukrainians get the ammunition uh, they must have to be able to continue to uh, push back the uh, Russian invaders. So, so uh, it is urgent that the United States make a decision um, and that the US Congress actually is able to turn the majority in the US public but also in the U.S. Congress into a concrete decision. Because every time I meet representatives from the U.S. Congress, I met many of them over the last weeks, they assure me that there is a majority in the U.S. and also in the U.S. Congress for support. But so far they haven't been able to turn that majority into decision, and that's, that's exactly what we all now are waiting for, and it is urgent. Thank you. Uh, Thomas from Fats. Thanks a lot, uh, Thomas Kuczka, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Secretary General, on the ammunition question, um, we've heard from the Czech Foreign Minister today that they still lack funding for their initiative to provide Ukraine on a short-term basis with 155 artillery ammunition. Have there been any signals today in the room that allies are willing to step up their short-term commitments, or have there been concrete commitments towards that? And a second question, President Zelensky last week has warned that if they don't get U.S. support 
they might have to retreat. How big do you assess the risk of a Russian breakthrough in the next months? Thank you. <clears throat> support from uh, NATO allies and support from the United States to Ukraine is something which benefits our own security interests. It is therefore in the security interests of the United States to make a decision and provide Ukraine with ammunition. Because by allocating a fraction of our defense budgets, we have enabled the Ukrainians to destroy significant parts of the Russian uh, combat capability without putting any NATO soldier or any US soldiers, uh, soldier in harm's way. So this is really something that is in our interest uh, to continue to do. And not, not only continue to do, but uh, to do uh, more, to step up, and to ensure that we do it in a predictable, robust uh, way for the long haul. That's exactly also why uh, we are now discussing how can we establish a more robust and institutional NATO framework around this support to make it more predictable, more long-term, and also to ensure uh, fair burden sharing. Um, uh, but while we are, of course, uh, discussing this as NATO, uh, and I expect a decision by the uh, summit, uh, I welcome the fact that we have now agreed to start planning. Uh, of course, we need also immediate support, and, um, and therefore um, uh, I urge allies to, uh, to continue and to step up uh, to make national contributions. Um, uh, and um, recently we have had the German uh, announcement of 576 million euros to support the Czech initiative for uh, more ammunition. Sweden, our newest ally, um, have just announced uh, uh, 800, uh, no support to, to deliver 800, no, to, 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 actually to, to support the Czech initiative to, to deliver 800,000 uh, extra artillery shells and also other allies have announced uh, more support for the Czech initiative. So uh, there, there, is, there are constant new announcements by different NATO allies. Thank you. Over to Irina Interfax. Okay, I'll get you. Thank you, Farah. Uh, Secretary General, News Agency Interfax Ukraine, Irina Sommer. Talking about expectation from upcoming summit in Washington, Ukrainian side speaks about some kind of invitation, like um, in the case of the European Union, where, where Ukraine is a candidate country but not member yet. Is it possible in the case of NATO? Can actually NATO invite Ukraine and then over the time when all criteria will be met, Ukraine will be a member of NATO. Thank you. So all allies agree that Ukraine will become a member. All allies agree uh, that uh, uh, we need to continue to uh, uh, move uh, uh, Ukraine closer to NATO membership. We made important decisions uh, last year. We are implementing those now uh, with the removal of the membership action plan. Uh, we should not introduce something that is similar to a kind of second uh, or two-step process. We are, I think it's very important to, to maintain the one-step process for uh, Ukraine to become a member, removing the, the requirement for membership action plan and then ensuring that uh, when an invitation is, is issued, then that's the same as becoming a member as it is in NATO. That's the difference between NATO and the European Union. In the European Union, of course, when you are invited, invited it can take years uh, from an invitation to membership. Uh, while in NATO, when you are invited, it's, it's something that happens very soon after. Um, so uh, so uh, we should just avoid creating also, again, a kind of two-step process towards uh, uh, membership. But regardless of the technicalities, there is a clear commitment uh, for uh, uh, Ukraine to become a, a member. There's a clear commitment to help to move Ukraine closer to uh, membership. And I think we also need to realize that when this war ends, uh, everyone realizes that there has to be some kind of guarantees uh, that um, this is really the end, uh, that it's not only a pause uh, where uh, Russia uh, reconstitutes its forces, rest and then regroup and then attack again. Uh, because that was something, uh, we saw a similar pattern back in 2014. They annexed Crimea, um, 
we all condemned that, and then after a few months they went in, into uh, uh, eastern Ukraine uh, or eastern uh, Donbass, uh, and then we had Minsk won. Uh, they, that was violated. They pushed the, the, the line for, further uh, uh, west. We had Minsk II, uh, a new uh, ceasefire, and then they waited for uh, uh, almost eight years, and then uh, they had a full-fledged invasion. So, of course, when this war ends, we have to be absolutely sure this is really the end. It stops here. And therefore, uh, we need to help Ukraine uh, build their own defenses uh, uh, to deter any further Russian aggression. But there will also be a need for uh, security guarantees. And of course, the ultimate security guarantee will be Article 5 and NATO membership. Thank you. We'll give a final question to Radio Cordon, Vladislav. Thank you. Uh, Hungarian Foreign Minister Petr Siarto uh, has publicly said that Hungary uh, will not support any initiatives that, uh, quote, would transform it into an offensive alliance. Uh, he was talking about NATO engaging more in coordination of military support uh, for Ukraine. Uh, what's your take on that? And uh, do you think your proposals will eventually be adopted at the Washington summit? Thank you. NATO is and will remain a defensive alliance, um, and uh, NATO uh, is and will remain uh, 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 not a party to uh, the conflict in Ukraine. And we need to remember what this is. Uh, this is a war or aggression by Russia invading another country, violating international law. And then Ukraine has the right, according to international law, to defend itself. Um, and uh, we, as uh, friends of Ukraine, we have the right to support Ukraine in upholding the right for self-defense, also uh, based on international uh, law. Uh, that doesn't make us party to the conflict, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a more robust NATO framework to coordinate and uh, security assistance training uh, will not change that. Uh, uh, NATO allies will fundamentally do the same as they do today on a more bilateral basis or in other frameworks, the EU, the Ramstein format, uh, and uh, through the multilateral uh, um, capability coalitions. Uh, so by creating a stronger NATO framework, what we will ensure is more transparency, more burden sharing, uh, more predictability, and a more robust uh, commitment, which is important to help the Ukrainians to plan, but also send a message to President Putin that he cannot uh, outweigh us on the battlefield. He has to sit down and negotiate some kind of agreement where uh, Ukraine prevails as a sovereign uh, independent nation. So the, the paradox is that if you want a peace, if you want an end to this war, the best way of achieving that is to ensure that Ukraine has the military strength uh, to convince Putin that he cannot win on the battlefield. He has to sit down and negotiate. Um, um, then uh, uh, what we are discussing is, is not a, a NATO uh, combat presence in Ukraine. We are discussing uh, how we can coordinate and, and deliver support from outside uh, Ukraine uh, to uh, Ukraine as NATO allies uh, uh, do. Um, so, uh, so I have good dialogue with uh, Petr Sialto. Um, I also have spoken uh, with the Hungarian uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban uh, twice over the last uh, uh, week. Uh, and uh, now when we initiate planning, I'm certain that we can also address uh, the concerns that uh, Hungary has raised and find a way where we can then have consensus um, uh, within weeks. Thank you, everyone. That's all we have time for. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Secretary-General. Thank you.
then um, burden sharing is always top on our agenda. Um, when NATO made the pledge to invest 2% of GDP uh, on defense uh, back in 2014, only three allies uh, met that uh, target. Uh, today, uh, two-thirds of NATO allies are spending 2% of GDP on defense. That's a, a significant progress, but of course we want more allies. We want all allies to be at 2%, and 2% is a minimum. So this is a message that uh, I and we all convey very strongly uh, as we prepare for the upcoming Washington summit. Then tomorrow we will also meet with uh, our Asia-Pacific partners, uh, and I think the war in Ukraine demonstrates how intertwined the security of uh, Europe uh, is with the security of Asia and the Pacific. Uh, uh, North Korea, uh, China, Iran are uh, supporting Russia's uh, war aggression in different ways. So uh, this demonstrates that security is not regional, security is truly global, and therefore it is important that we work together with our Asia-Pacific uh, partners. And again, thank you for uh, the strong uh, U.S. leadership and also uh, on this issue. Then lastly, uh, tomorrow we will celebrate NATO's 75th anniversary. We'll actually meet to, tonight at the Truman Hall, uh, but also then tomorrow uh, uh, we will mark it here uh, at the NATO headquarters. And, uh, and uh, uh, then we will also uh, mark the 75th anniversary at the uh, NATO summit in Washington in July. Thank you for hosting the summit, and it will be a great summit to celebrate the alliance, but also to ensure that we continue to adapt and to ensure that NATO main, uh, continues to be the most successful alliance in history. So, Tony, welcome. All the good to have you here. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And uh, as always, I, I have to start by um, telling you how much we appreciate, more than appreciate. We're grateful for your extraordinary leadership of this alliance at what is an extraordinary time. Um, but as a result of that leadership, uh, we have an alliance that uh, we will celebrate in a couple of months in, uh, in Washington for the 75th anniversary summit, uh, an alliance that is stronger, bigger, and more united than ever. And, and as the Secretary General said, tomorrow as we f begin to formally celebrate the 75th anniversary, of course, we're looking back at uh, the first 75 years, but the work today the work tomorrow, the work at the summit, is really about the next 75 and everything that we need to do now to ensure that this alliance remains what it has been, as Jens said, the most successful in history. A defensive alliance with no designs on the territory of any other country, but with a determination to protect the territory of each of its members and to do it in a way that is, has been unique in, um, in human history. Uh, based on the principle that we have each other's backs, that if one of us is the victim of aggression, all of us will be in to help. And that's the most effective way to actually prevent aggression from happening in the first place and to create an environment in each of our countries where people don't have to worry about uh, security in that sense uh, and they can make the most of their lives and reach their full uh, potential. That's really what this alliance is all about. But it requires constant renewal, constant effort. It doesn't just happen by itself. And so the work that we're doing today to prepare for the, the summit, uh, to ensure that everyone is picking up their share of the burden, uh, to make sure that the Alliance has the capabilities and the capacity to contend not just with the problems we've had to face over the last 75 years, but so many new challenges, some of which Secretary General alluded to, that we have to confront now, uh, and to make sure that uh, countries continue to do their part as well when it comes to helping Ukraine deal with the ongoing aggression from Russia. All of these things are front and center. Um, so we've had a very good session today uh, focused on, uh, on preparations for the summit and the substance of the summit. Uh, more to follow uh, with Ukraine, with our partners, uh, and uh, with the ongoing work to strengthen our alliance for the future. But once again, none of this uh, would have been possible uh, as uh, effectively as we've seen it, without the leadership of the Secretary General. Jens, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.